Good morning, everybody. It is 7 o'clock. The cost of living crisis is about to get even worse. Energy bills are going up by several hundred pounds a year for the average household, pushing more families into fuel poverty. Can the government get a grip on soaring prices before it's too late? From the pork pie plot to the cream tea coup, more letters from Tory MPs who want to get rid of the PM. And then after nine, a powerful report from our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, which you really don't want to miss, on the children on the front line of a humanitarian disaster in Afghanistan. It's Thursday, the 3rd of February. Cost of living crisis, millions facing a rise of hundreds of pounds a year on their energy bills, with a massive price coup hike, uh, price cap hike, forgive me, expected today. I'm in Newham in East London where families already struggling to pay their bills. Wait to see what the Chancellor plans to do to cope with the soaring cost of living. Growing pressure on Boris Johnson to quit from his own MPs as three more submit no confidence letters. I'm in Beijing where the Chinese and Russian foreign ministers are holding talks today on the crisis in Ukraine. Welcoming the world again, New Zealand's border will open in stages from the end of the month. I am yours, you are mine, you are what you are, you make it fun. Streaming controversy, Crosby, Stills and Nash join the artists who pulled their music from Spotify. Also to come on the programme this morning, the sleep secrets of an Olympic champion. We'll speak to gold medal winner Greg Rutherford on why sleep is his superpower. Why would I betray you? We all have our secrets. We just didn't get to yours yet. Goodness. Shake and not stare. Daniel Craig's final outing as Bond among the favourites as the BAFTA nominees are announced later on today. Good morning, everybody. It's thought that around a quarter of households will be pushed into fuel poverty with the price cap expected to go up by 51%. That means bills of more than £1,900 compared to the current cap of £1,277 a year. Um, Helen Ann has more. It's on streets like these where rising bills really bite. Abdul spends as much spare time as he has delivering food parcels to people in Bradford. You got your milk, you got your bread, everything in there. He says the number of calls have nearly doubled since this time last year. Even as we drive around, they keep coming. I mean, I'm getting called through nine and ten o'clock in the evening. People have just got nothing in their fridges. It's either buy some food um, or heat their house up. They have no choice. There we go, ma. Take care, love. He knows a hike in energy bills will be crippling to people like Emma. But the price cap in place to protect people is set to rise by as much as 50%. Emma can't afford to heat the house often. When she does, it doesn't last long. It stays warm for about 10, 15 minutes and then that's it. Even if we're under quilt and we have a hot water bottle, it's still cold and we just sit there shaking and everything. Rising bills will affect millions of us, but they'll bite the hardest for those with the fewest choices. And that includes the option to move on. In Barking and Dagenham, there aren't enough permanent homes. Aleph Jane and her family are stuck here while they wait for one. You can see mould. The damp and cold are so bad, the walls literally drip with condensation. Mould grows everywhere. I did, just to mention, clean up on Saturday. Warming this place is expensive, and she's worried. This whole month, I've... I've struggled, I've I'd put in whatever I can afford, and that could be like two pounds to four pounds to highest would be 10 or 15 pounds. But then that would mean I have to take something off my budget. So one less thing for the kids. Millions of households could soon face energy bills of around 2,000 pounds a year. Whether that much can be managed depends a lot on who you are and where you live. Helen Ann Smith, Sky News. We well, sent Ashna to East London, which has the highest rate of fuel poverty in England with us now. Oh, my goodness me, these poor people, they must be terrified about what's going to be said later on today. 
I think they are going to be very much so, Kay. Helen Ann was right there. Often it does depend on geography. It depends on the type of house you're living in, the size of your household. And here in Newham, they do have the highest rate of fuel poverty in England. That translates to about a fifth of households, some 23,500 families who are struggling to heat their homes already. With this price cap rising, it could end up being that by April, as soon as April, their bills could rise in excess of perhaps £1,500 going up to maybe £2,000. And that's really going to affect people on those standard variable tariffs, but also people who are on prepaid metres. And we know that for people that tend to be on prepaid metres, perhaps in the past they have had problems and, and struggled to pay their electricity bills and energy bills in the past. And therefore, perhaps changing supplier, changing what tariff they're on isn't going to be that much of a, of a help for them. And of course, more people are working from home. Those colder winters, of course, we are consistently reminded of the cost that it takes to warm our homes. Many people also fear that this limit, whilst it is called a limit, increasingly energy suppliers are seeing that as a target price. So their bills could be around that price. It could be lower than that energy cap, but it could also be higher. And that is very much the fear for people here they are going to be waiting with bated breath to see what the Chancellor can offer them to ease that burden. OK, Ashna, thank you. Tomorrow's here. When will we hear from the Chancellor? We're we'll here at the ch from the Chancellor at 11, which is the time that the regulator will announce what the price cap is, expected to be knocking on for £2,000 wow. over this period. He will stand up in the Commons and announce the support that the government is offering, which we understand is going to be a discount for all households of around £200 covered by government loans to the energy companies, which will have to be paid back at some stage, possibly on our bills. And we think that there's another rabbit coming out of the hat as well to be announced either in the Commons or at a press conference we understand the Chancellor is doing afterwards. And there's talk in the newspapers today of people getting a rebate on their council tax for people whose properties are in the lowest bands, which would add uh, another couple of hundred pounds. So these are big interventions from a Chancellor who's been uh, reluctant to spend money, who says that we, you know, we need to um, now um, pull the purse strings back after COVID. But the government know that this is a really serious cost of living squeeze and they need a big intervention in order Order, uh, to make sure that people aren't going to be facing a really difficult time over the next few months. OK, um, tomorrow's take, of course, at nine o'clock. Uh, meantime, more letters handed in to the 1922 committee. Just explain yes. to our viewers what that means. Drip, drip of letters from Tory MPs calling on the Prime Minister to resign. If that number of letters hits 54, which is 15% of Conservative MPs, then there is a vote of confidence in Boris Johnson. We saw three yesterday. Tobias Elwood on our programme said that he now thinks the Prime Minister shouldn't carry on. He sent in a letter. And then two other MPs we heard from also yesterday, uh, both from Devon, which is why it's being dubbed in a newspaper um, the, uh, the cream coup. Cream tea coup. Cream tea coup even, uh, based on two letters, perhaps a bit of a stretch, but this is one of them, Anthony Magnol from Totnes. He said, standards in public life matter. At this time, I can no longer support the PM. His actions and mistruths are overshadowing the extraordinary work of so many excellent ministers and colleagues. I have submitted a letter of no confidence. We also heard a bit later in the day from Gary Streeter, MP for South West Devon. He said, I cannot reconcile the pain and sacrifice of the vast majority of the British public during lockdown with the attitude and activities of those working in Downing Street. Accordingly, I have now submitted a letter seeking a motion of confidence in the Prime Minister. I have not come to this decision lightly. It is not my intention to say any more about this matter. I think what's interesting, Kay, is these MPs appear to be disconnected from each other. This is not a one faction. This is not like with Theresa May when it was obvious that the hardcore Brexiteer faction wanted to get rid of her. These are people... Gary Streeter elected in 1992, Anthony Magnall elected in 2019. They, aren't, they don't seem to be coordinated, although perhaps they are and we don't know about it, but that will what really worry Downing Street. This is These are shots coming out of nowhere and it could be that at some point soon we do hit that 54 threshold. OK. Tomorrow for now. Tomorrow's take, as I said, at nine o'clock. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, where's the minister? We're going to have the minister on the programme uh, in the next hour, so stay tuned for more on that. And the story of rising energy costs is dominating the front pages this morning. The Financial Times reports that, in cooperation with the Bank of England, the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, will announce a package of measures aimed at curbing inflation and averting a cost-of-living crisis.
The Telegraph describes Mr Sunak as splashing out on the multi-billion pound package. The Mail says the heat is now on. The Chancellor, with bills expected to rise by £650 for some households. The Mirror calls it D-Day on Price's agony, while The Times hears council tax rebates could be on the cards in an attempt to ease some of the pain. But the Eye speaks to sources who believe it hasn't been properly funded and lacks ambition. More on the cost of living crisis now, rising energy bills, soaring inflation and higher interest rates. The Confederation of British Industry, the CBI, says the UK is caught in a trap of low growth and high taxes. The CBI Director General, Tony Danker, is with us now. Hello to you, Mr Danker. Thank you so much um, for taking the time to join us on the programme this morning. What a mess it is for so many families up and down the country. Um, what do we need to hear, do you think, from the Chancellor later on today? And, and what advice can you give to people? Well, look, if the trails are to be believed, the Chancellor is going to take some action to smooth this cliff edge of rising energy bills. Uh, and that's good news. So first and foremost, I think the government taking action is good news. Uh, we hear that actually the method they may choose to deal with this is to put loans uh, on the books of energy companies. I'm not sure that's the right way forward, but let's find out when the detail comes. I think my real concern, and I think everybody's real concern, is that this rise in uh, gas prices, in energy bills, is not just going to be a one-off, right? We are probably looking at two or three years' worth of very high energy bills. And whilst our economy is growing at the moment, coming back from uh, the crisis, uh, the economy is set to really fall in terms of growth over the next two or three years. So I'm afraid we may be talking on this program about energy prices for two or three years. Uh, today, it's great that we're tackling, you know, the, the, the Chancellor, I hope, will, will grasp the nettle. But this could be an issue for us for the next few years. And my question is really whether or not the economy is going to grow fast enough after this year for everybody to have the wage growth they need to cope with higher bills. Yeah, because the growth forecasts, I think, are between 1.3 and 1.7 per cent, something like that, uh, compared yeah. to past yeah. of levels of, what, 2 to 2 and a, uh, two, two, two and a half. So, That's right. I mean, um, this year, we, we should grow at 6%. You know, this is the, if you remember, people talk about a V-shaped recovery, right? This is the way back up. We should grow at 6%. But already next year, that drops to 2 and then it drops to one3 so uh, we may be kicking the can down the road to deal with the uh, energy crisis uh, the way we're dealing with it now. Don't get me wrong, smoothing that cliff edge is critical and you know, well done to the government for tackling it. Uh, let's see the detail. But I think this is a much more profound problem for how Britain is going to grow its economy and grow wages in the next three to five years. Uh, you said the economy cannot sustain, I'm quoting you, ever increasing taxes. Who would have said that about a Conservative government? No, I think that's right. Look, this, the government's in a tough spot now. Conservative thinkers are in a tough spot because, of course, the Conservatives believe in low taxes, but they also believe in tight public spending. Uh, and I think we are stuck in this trap, really, where on the one hand, the public spending pressure on things like the health service is great, so nobody wants to cut spending. Taxes are already about to go up to their highest in 70 years. So what's the way out of that? The only way out of that, uh, to avoid either austerity or even higher taxes, is to grow the economy faster. And yet we are forecast to grow the economy slower than Britain usually does. So we need to do better than that. What did you make of yesterday's levelling up announcements by Mr Gove? Yeah, look, I think the levelling up white paper yesterday did a couple of things finally. One is they, they, they basically defined levelling up. They said, here are the 12 things levelling up will achieve and, you know, hold us accountable for the targets by 2030. That's really welcome. They put in place a lot of good foundations to make sure that money uh, spent by government isn't concentrated only in the southeast. That's good. They're trying to strengthen the role of mayors and have mayors uh, as major figures in driving local economies, and that's good. What we don't yet have is a plan for how we're going to get around the country lots of private sector growth outside the well-familiar uh, spaces and cities in our country. And so that's the bit I'm looking forward to working with Michael Gove and his colleagues on over the coming months. Because, to be honest, if it doesn't turn into, you know, better firms, better jobs and better wages, then people will turn around and say, what was it all about? Would you like to swap roles with the Chancellor at the moment? No, look, the Chancellor has a very tough job and I think he's trying to balance uh, quite a lot of things. I think he's doing a good job in that regard. Uh, it's a big day for him. But to be honest, it's a big day really 
for everybody in the country who I think are trying to manage cost of living uh, crisis. Uh, and we're incredible. I know they're talking to business leaders. They're incredibly attuned uh, to affordability, to wage pressures, to cost pressures. And so I think all of us are confronting a cost of living squeeze in this quarter in particular. And we need to think hard to make sure, look, if it's going to be a bumpy quarter, what we can't have is a bumpy decade. And we need to think about how we're going to grow the economy so that we don't find ourselves in this pickle uh, every year for the next five years. Good to talk to you. Thanks for taking the time, as I said. Thank, Thank you. you. We know that so many of you are struggling at the moment already with your energy bills and uh, that increase is coming. I'm afraid we're we'll going to be talking to some of the energy companies during the programme to see what, if anything, they can do to try to help you. Something like one in four households are going to find themselves in fuel poverty, um, depending on what the increase will be. So we'll talk about that throughout the course of the programme today and the uh, Chancellor making his announcement at 11 o'clock, which of course we'll cover here on Sky. Uh, this hour, though, we're going to be talking in more detail about the cost of energy on everyone's mind, of course. And uh, we'll speak to the founder, as I said, of a company offering its customers a green alternative. Is it cheaper? Vaccine mandate U-turn. We'll speak to a physio student refusing to get jabbed as the government considers scrapping mandatory COVID jabs for NHS staff. And then shortly after H, the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Pat McFadden, will be here to give us his take on those rising energy prices. Before that, though, the United States and France have agreed to coordinate their response to Russia's military buildup on the Ukrainian border. It comes as President Biden pledged to deploy an extra 3,000 troops to support NATO countries in Eastern Europe. The move comes amid growing tensions with Russia, which has massed more than 100,000 troops on the border with Ukraine. The Pentagon says the US deployment is a preventative measure. These are not permanent moves. They are moves designed to respond to the current security environment. Moreover, these forces are not going to fight in Ukraine. They are going to ensure the robust defense of our NATO allies. Today, the Russian foreign minister is in Beijing for talks with his Chinese counterpart. Um, Tom is standing by in Beijing for us. Um, hello to you, Tom. How do we envisage that going? Morning, Kay. Yeah, well, today is really a curtain raiser for the big meeting which is going to happen tomorrow when President Xi Jinping will welcome President Vladimir Putin. He's called him his best friend in the past. Xi Jinping hasn't met another world leader uh, over the last two years because of the COVID situation and staying in China, and Putin's going to be the first. And they have got incredibly close together. Chinese state media describe them as uh, standing back to back against their opponents, specifically in relation to this crisis in Ukraine. And China has been supporting Russia. Uh, it voiced its support for Russia's concern over NATO and the US. It's been working at the United Nations Security Council uh, to stop action happening there. And I think we can expect some specifics from this meeting tomorrow, especially in terms of trade deals, gas deals, uh, things like that. President Putin was writing in Xinhua, which is Chinese state media here. Uh, he had an op-ed there and he listed a couple of things that he was looking forward to, including that gas deal, which could be useful for Russia if gas supplies to Europe are shut off. It's another source of revenue in the event of a conflict with Ukraine. He also said they're working together on creating mechanisms to offset the negative impact of unilateral sanctions. Um, so that threat of sanctions, China and Russia already working together to try and mitigate that. So they are very close indeed. Now, some people have suggested there might be an Olympic truce, that we won't see any conflict in Ukraine while the Winter Olympics are happening here in Beijing. They open tomorrow night. Uh, and the idea that perhaps President Xi has asked uh, President Putin uh, to hold off and not spoil his parade. But on the other hand, it's worth thinking back to 2008, the Summer Olympics, also here in Beijing. The evening of the opening ceremony is when we got the first reports of Russian troops moving into Georgia. So it's not a given that something won't happen over the next two weeks, despite that burgeoning friendship between uh, Presidents Putin and Xi. OK, thank you. Thanks a lot. Something happening on the uh, programme next week to tell you about. 9am next Monday morning, 7th of February, the Education Secretary, Nadim Zahawi, will be here to answer all of your questions. You can send them to us via Twitter or email your questions or send us a video clip of your questions. You can email asktheeducationsecretary at sky.com. UK. So many of you have already sifting through them as we speak and we will be putting some of your questions to the Education Secretary on Monday morning at nine o'clock. 
The British government has said it won't intervene after Northern Ireland's Agriculture Minister announced a halt to checks on goods entering the country from the rest of the UK. The move appears to defy trading rules which were implemented after the UK left the European Union. Our senior island correspondent David Blevins has more. On the surface, this is about trade, whether or not checks should continue to be carried out between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, as agreed by the EU and British government as part of the wider Brexit deal. But in reality, it's about politics, because the border in the Irish Sea, designed to avoid a border on this island, has raised unionist fears about Northern Ireland's place in the United Kingdom. So it's a unionist minister who acted unilaterally to order an end to those checks, much to the fury of other parties in what's supposed to be a power-sharing government at Stormont. The Irish government says it's a breach of international law, the British government says it's not getting involved. But how can it avoid getting involved? Because this puts huge pressure on the devolved government at Stormont. We're just three months from an election here, and I think we're witnessing the beginning of the end of this administration. New Zealand has announced plans to reopen its borders in stages, although it will be many months before the country is open to everybody. Here's Siobhan. So finally, a thaw in what have been some of the toughest coronavirus border restrictions in the world. New Zealand laying out its five steps to reopening, and this is the timetable they're going to be working to. So from the 27th of February, vaccinated New Zealanders in Australia will be able to come back quarantine-free. From the 13th of March, vaccinated New Zealanders around the world can return. They're also looking to open up to some skilled workers. Then in April, they'll look to welcome around 5,000 international students. In July, non-citizens from countries which usually get a visa waiver who are vaccinated can start to visit. And then in October, they hope to reopen to the rest of the world. Now, this is important. You have to be vaccinated, otherwise you would still have to quarantine. Uh, but this is going to be a huge step forward for New Zealanders who have been stuck outside the country, some not seeing their families for two years. But I think it's also an important step because it shows us where we are with coronavirus globally. At the beginning, when New Zealand brought in these really tough restrictions, it was really seen as keeping people safe. But as coronavirus has become endemic in an increasing number of countries, many people inside New Zealand are criticising its government for being out of step with the rest of the world. And we're also um, just hearing within the last few moments, we've heard from the uh, Swedish Prime Minister via the Reuters News Agency um, saying uh, that it does look as though the pandemic in Sweden is heading to a new phase. Um, and the latest on that is that restrictions that are presently in place will be lifted when they come to an end at the end of the week next week. So... It's uh, becoming time to remove restrictions, is what uh, the Swedish Prime Minister has said. Could life be getting back to normal? Whisper it quietly, but it's heading in that direction. Latest COVID data in the UK for today, showing the highest number of daily deaths, though, in almost a year. We've had more than 88,000 new cases of coronavirus confirmed in the UK in the last 24-hour period. Another 534 deaths recorded, the highest number since last February. That takes the total number of deaths within 28 days of a positive test to 157,409. The UK Health Security Agency said the number of deaths is high because the data includes what it calls a backlog of recent fatalities. Meantime, the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, says he has put the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Dame Cressida Dick, on notice on notice after evidence of sexist, racist and homophobic behaviour among officers. His comments came after a 90-minute meeting with the Commissioner. However, any decision to dismiss her would have to be made by the Home Secretary, Priti Patel. Suffering two or more chronic health problems in midlife more than doubles the risk of dementia. A study found illnesses such as heart disease, high blood pressure and diabetes could all have an impact, especially if developed at a younger age. Ryanair has been ranked the worst short-haul airline by customers for dealing with refunds during the pandemic. One in five passengers surveyed by the consumer group, which said it took more than a month to get a refund. British Airways was voted second lowest for refund satisfaction. Jet2.com was ranked the best. 
It's claimed poisoned cocaine has killed 20 people and made 74 others seriously ill in Argentina, according to health officials. Police say a dozen people had been arrested after the batch was found to be sold in a poor neighbourhood of Buenos Aires. Around 1,000 US officials struck down with a mysterious illness known as Havana syndrome could have been targeted by electromagnetic energy pulses. A report by US intelligence experts believe this could explain the ear pain, vertigo and other symptoms first reported by embassy staff in the Cuban capital in 2016. Airlines cancelled hundreds of flights on Wednesday as a major winter storm battered parts of mid-America, with states as far south as New Mexico issuing warnings. The forecast comes nearly a year after a catastrophic winter storm devastated the Texas power grid, causing hundreds of deaths. Back to Beijing for you now, where a Belgian skeleton racer has been freed from isolation after a tearful plea for help. Kim Mailmans was originally told she could leave her quarantine hotel after three days after she tested positive for COVID. But yesterday, rather than return her to the Olympic Village, the 25-year-old was taken to a different facility for another week of isolation. I'm supposed to stay here for um, another seven days with two PCRs a day and no contact with anybody else. We are not even sure I will ever be allowed to return to the village. <laughs> and obviously this is very hard for me. Well, after posting that emotional video on Instagram, the International Olympic Committee intervened and Kim has now been moved to a single room in the village. I am now in a wing that's just isolation but at least I'm back in the village. I feel safe and um, I'll be able to train a little better here. What a difference a day makes. Now, a popular podcaster, Joe Rogan, is continuing to face a backlash after being accused of spreading misinformation about COVID-19 and vaccines. Neil Young and Joni Mitchell are among the artists who pulled their music from the platform Spotify in protest. I and then... am yours, you are mine. You are what you are. You make it hard. Crosby, Stills and Nash have joined their fellow musicians in boycotting the musical um, streaming service. Uh, in a joint statement, they said, we support Neil and we agree with him that there is dangerous disinformation being aired on Spotify's Joe Rogan podcast. While we always value alternate points of view, knowingly spreading disinformation during this global pandemic has deadly consequences. Until real action is taken to show that a concern for humanity must be balanced with commerce, we don't want our music or the music we made together to be on the same platform. Is now the time when I tell you I've never heard of that band. I know. I know. I don't, seriously, Darren, my director, is saying he's never heard of them either, so there you go. It's that time of year again. The nominees for this year's BAFTA Awards will be announced later on today. What little lady made these? I did, sir. <laughs> oh, it's not very nice. The Power of the Dog and West Side Story are among the favourites tipped to receive multiple awards at the ceremony. The shortlist for this year's Rising Star Prize has already been announced. Nominees include No Time to Die's Lashner Lynch and West Side Story's Ariana DeBose. The category's the only one at the ceremony voted for by the public. Do you have a favourite? I've not seen West Side Story yet, but apparently it's fantastic. And Piers is telling me in my ear, everybody's talking to me this morning. Um, yeah, apparently it is very good. It's Steven Spielberg, isn't it, Piers? I think I'm right in saying that. So um, let me know if you've seen it. Perhaps you'd like to tweet me at, uh, directly at Kay Burley. Quick look at the weather. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Staying mostly mild today, but colder air following a rain band into the northwest will spread to all parts by tomorrow morning. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. If we couldn't love her anymore, 
the Duchess of Cambridge, Kate Middleton, has been showing off her rugby skills after becoming patron of the Rugby Football League and the Rugby Football Union. Most impressive. Her, um, her Royal Highness quite literally living up to her name as she's hoisted into the air there. Kate is a well-known rugby fan and, judging by this display, she might be spending less time watching in the grandstand and perhaps more time playing on the field. The role was previously held by Prince Harry. I'll teach him. And let's have a look at some of the uh, pictures that we've found in the papers for you today. Uh, the Times features two British women having broken the record for the fastest female pair to row across the Atlantic. Great photograph. Jessica Oliver, uh, Charlotte Harris had rowed before. They, neither of them actually had rowed before, starting the 3,000-mile trip, but wiped five days off the record. If you want something done, ask a woman. If you want it really done, Ask two. Now, it was Groundhog Day yesterday, again. The Guardian with this shot of the 136th annual event in Pennsylvania, where Phil, the groundhog, saw his own shadow, meaning a prediction of another six weeks of winter. I'm trying to remember, is it Pen Pensacola, Phil? Can't remember. And have you ever been this hungry? A buzzard and a red kite posed in the Telegraph, uh, as they fight over dinner in Wiltshire. It took the photographer 20 hours to get the shot. I think you'll agree with us that it was absolutely well worth it. Not quite sure which one won. Maybe they shared. Coming up, energy bills are expected to rise by hundreds of pounds. We'll speak to a supplier very shortly. Stay tuned. Hello again, everybody. Our top stories for you on The Breakfast programme this Thursday morning. The energy regulator Ofgem is expected to announce a new price cap this morning that will increase household bills by hundreds of pounds. Three more Conservative MPs have revealed that they have submitted letters of no confidence in uh, that man, Boris Johnson, in the last 24 hours. And the United States and France have agreed to coordinate their response to Russia's military build-up on the Ukrainian border, while the Chinese and Russian foreign ministers are in Beijing to discuss the ongoing crisis. More on our top story now. Energy prices are set to rise significantly for millions of households who are already facing soaring bills. The regulator Ofgem will announce the new energy price cap later on this morning. The Director General of the Confederation of British Industry, the CBI, says today's announcement won't be the last. My real concern, and I think everybody's real concern, is that this rise in uh, gas prices, in energy bills, is not just going to be a one-off, right? We are probably looking at two or three years' worth of very high energy bills. And whilst our economy is growing at the moment, coming back from uh, the crisis, uh, the economy is set to really fall in terms of growth over the next two or three years. We may be kicking the can down the road to deal with the uh, energy crisis uh, the way we're dealing with it now. Don't get me wrong, smoothing that cliff edge is critical. And, you know, well done to the government for tackling it. Uh, let's see the detail. But I think this is a much more profound problem for how Britain is going to grow its economy and grow wages in the next three to five years. Tamara's here. Tamara, um, so what, what's happening today? We're going to hear from the Chancellor. That's right. At 11 o'clock, we'll get the announcement from Ofgem, the regulator, of what the price rise, the price cap will be on energy bills, how much they could rise to. We expect right. that to be £600 per household or thereabouts, an absolutely huge rise. Shortly after that, we will hear from the Chancellor in the House of Commons. He will set out what support the government is offering families to help with that. We expect that's going to be a discount of around £200 for everyone. You remember he's talking, he'd been talking for weeks about targeting support at the poorest. We expect this is actually going to be for all households to be funded by billions of pounds the government will loan to energy companies. Now, that will be good as a one-off, but as Tony Danker of the CBI was saying, we expect that it won't be a one-off because energy bills could stay very high for the next two to three years or yeah. beyond because global gas prices may well remain high. So what's the Chancellor going to do then? Because the energy companies will have to pay those loans back. 
then we will also get a Downing Street press conference from Rishi Sunak at five o'clock today. And we expect he has another rabbit in his hat as well. There's a lot of talk in the papers today about uh, people getting a rebate on their council tax if they live in properties in the lowest bands, A, B and C. We haven't seen any detail of that yet, but that would help people uh, on low incomes as well. It won't cover the whole price rise, but they're clearly getting the big guns out aware that people are going to be really struggling over the next few months. But how is it going, how is it going to be paid for in the long term is, of course, a big question. Um, and also something on the Prime Minister's mind today while all of this is going on is whether or not he's still going to keep his job anytime soon. That's right. We've seen an interesting drip drip of Tory MPs sending in letters calling for him to resign. We had three yesterday. Tobias Elwood, former Defence Minister, on our programme. He's been quite critical but said he wants the Prime Minister to go now. He sent in his letter. Then we had two more MPs yesterday, seemingly disconnected from each other, both Devon MPs, which is why it's been called the, the cream tea coup. We had um, one called Anthony Magnol uh, from Totnes. Uh, he, he sent... Um, he um, sent in a letter and tweeted that he could no longer support the Prime Minister and Gary Streeter, another Devon MP. So the question is, is this coordinated? So far, we don't think it is. We think this is MPs soul-searching and just coming to the same conclusion. They don't seem to be a, a faction or a clique connected to each other and that will really worry Downing Street that uh, these shots could come Quite out of nowhere. A few of them are army men, though, aren't they? Well, Gary Streeter and Anthony Magnall, I don't think, are. Um, but Tobias Elwood has been very critical of the government on defence and foreign policy, certainly. But where the next letter is coming from, you know, you're hearing from quiet MPs who don't normally talk to the TV studios suddenly putting their letters in. And um, it, we don't simply don't know, nobody knows, because this is a secret process, how close we are to the 54 letters, that's 15% of Tory MPs, which would trigger um, a no-confidence vote in Boris Johnson. Yeah. There's some suggestions that Downing Street are braced for it happening. Let the record state that we are 40 minutes into the show and we have not mentioned Sue Gray once. A record. <laughs> Indeed. We'll see you at nine o'clock. Thank you. Let's get a perspective on the energy crisis. Um, here we go. From one of the suppliers. Joining us is the founder of the green energy company, Ecotricity, and that's Dale Vince. Hi, Dale. It's good to see you this morning. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. What a challenging day for everybody, including you guys. Yeah, it's been a challenging five or six months, really. You know, the energy crisis began in August, and so far the government have done nothing except hold to the retail price cap while letting wholesale prices go through the roof, and they've bankrupted 50% of the suppliers in the market. What we'll see today is far too little and far too late, and, and for not long enough. As the CBI guy said, this crisis will continue for three years. £200 is one-third of the price rise that will be announced today for one-third of the time that the problem will endure. It's tackling one-tenth of the problem. It's a sticking plaster. And to lend the money to energy companies, to lend the money to customers, honestly, it's a joke. Um, I'm looking at the figures uh, suggesting the price cap will rise 50, 50, 50, 0 percent What's that going to mean for your customers? Um, we're not a price capped company, so it's different for our customers. But for millions of people around the country, it's just going to make, well, energy bills unaffordable. There are plenty of people, probably about uh, 4 million people already in energy poverty. That figure is, is set to go to six or seven. Um, uh, it's only surpassed by the number of people in food poverty. Of course, national insurance rises kick in in April as well. That's another 12 billion. But look, the, the thing that doesn't get talked about is the government talks about high energy prices and, and how they want to do something about it. What they're going to announce today is not going to solve that problem. But the government takes nine billion pounds every year from our energy bills by way of tax, VAT and five stealth taxes. If they want to solve this problem properly, they should stop taxing energy or have a windfall tax on the North Sea sector that have made £20 billion this winter through these crazy wholesale prices. Yeah, although the Prime Minister, I think, has ruled that out, at least for now. What about energy independence, which is something that you've talked about previously? What, what is that? <clears throat> That's the proper long-term answer to this problem. So uh, we're in this situation because we're dependent on fossil fuels, but we're also dependent on uh, international markets to set the price of fossil fuels. So one of the scandals of the energy crisis is 50% of our gas comes from the North Sea, and yet we're paying 10 times more for it than we used to because of global prices. So we have two dependencies. One is on fossil fuels and the other is on global markets. Energy independence is about making our own energy, electricity and gas here in Britain from the wind and the sun. We can make gas from grass and we can 
be completely independent of foreign fossil fuel markets. And pre-crisis, we spent 50 billion pounds a year bringing fossil fuels to our country just to burn them. If we spent that budget for two or three years, we could make all of the energy we need from renewable energy. We would never have rising energy bills again because renewable energy doesn't go up in price. We could solve fuel poverty and really strengthen our economy. It's just time that we did it, time that we stopped using fossil fuels and broke away from global markets to set the price of our energy bills. But is green ex energy expensive to start with? No, <clears throat> it's the cheapest form of new energy that we can build. Um, so why do we have the myth that it's it's much more expensive than burning fossil fuels, which is why we do it? I don't know, because, uh, you know, right now, offshore wind, for example, has no public money, no support at all. Onshore solar has no public money at all. Nuclear is costing a fortune in, in subsidies that are added to our energy bills. Um, I don't know. It, Certainly, there's a faction in the Conservative Party that are against green energy and green measures and, and climate change and that kind of stuff. And they like to talk up the cost of green energy. But it is a myth, as you say. Mm. What's your advice to people who are watching at home, anxiously waiting for what this price cap is going to be and already thinking, I, I can't heat the house as it is or the flat or whatever? I think it's a real problem. I mean, there are no easy answers. Price cap tariffs are the cheapest energy that you can find, and they're still too expensive. We need the government to do something, actually do something, not offer to lend us money so that we can lend it to customers who have to pay it back later. What good is that? They need to stop taxing energy bills. £300 every year is a government tax on our energy bills. They should give that back. Good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed for the update. Much appreciated. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, just um, to let you know, uh, you've probably seen in the paper this morning that there were four jets, Russian jets, that were headed off by the RAF um, yesterday afternoon. They didn't get into British airspace, but they certainly headed in this direction. What were they up to? Um, and what's going to happen next with Ukraine? We're going to be talking about that with Lord Dannett coming up shortly. Uh, before that, though, have a look at this. Seemed like a good game, chasing some wild geese. There we go. But it landed Watson, the golden retriever, in very cold water. Oh, what was he doing? During the chase, Watson went through the ice of a frozen pond in Colorado. A firefighter came to the rescue and managed to get both the dog and himself out of the freezing water. Watson seemed happy. He doesn't look that happy to me. <laughs> there you go. Did you know that dogs shake from their heads backwards? You ever seen the slow-mo pictures of dogs... Shaking. If you haven't, have a look on YouTube. It's brilliant. Anyway, wagging tail, back with owner. Can I chase them again, Mum? No, you can't. On your lead. Um, also, have a look at this. Uh, a bit of a row has uh, erupted over this. These pictures show divers off the coast of Newport Harbour in Rhode Island, where researchers think they might have found the final resting place of HMS Endeavour, the ship of British explorer Captain James Cook, after a 22-year search operation, the Australian National Maritime Museum insists that this is the right site. But researchers in the US say the data is disputable. Watch this space. We might feature that on the programme next week. We'll have a look into that for you and see what else we can find out. Uh, we'll speak to a physio student as well this hour, refusing to get jabbed as the government considers scrapping mandatory jabs for NHS staff. If you've got a view on that, it really does divide opinion. You can tweet us directly if you would like to, at Kay Burley. See you in a second. Hello, everybody. How's your Thursday morning going? Let me tell you about the government considering scrapping controversial mandatory jabs for NHS staff, with a plan now under review. But it's left many NHS workers unsure if they'll lose their jobs if they don't get vaccinated. Joining us now is Mariah Banton, a physio student who has decided not to get the COVID vaccine. Hi, Mariah. Thank you for joining us. First of all, why don't you want the vaccine? Um, well, there's many reasons why I don't want the vaccine. I think there isn't enough data for myself so far to get it. Also, I did an antibody test myself, so I know that I've got all the antibodies to protect myself. Um, so after, you know, considering all the information I've had, um, I've decided that for me, it's probably not the best, best um, thing to do right now. Um, what about other people that you come into contact with? Do we not have a social responsibility to look after all of us? 
Yeah, 100%. I do believe that, especially as healthcare workers. And we're, we are taught that. Um, but we're also taught that we know everyone has the right to choose and there's body, me, body um, you know, it's our bodies and that we need to make a decision for ourselves. Um, for myself, if I, I love people, I love healthcare and I really love helping people. And if I felt like I was a harm to them, you know, I wouldn't do it. But knowing that I've got antibodies, um, knowing that I know I'm healthy and that I'm testing and I'm wearing PPE, I don't really see how I would be that much harm to people um, in, in the healthcare setting. But you, you could, am I right in saying you could actually pass on COVID-19 to someone else if you're not vaccinated? Is that not right? Well, it's the same as vaccinated people. You know, um, in my class, there's probably two of us that are not vaccinated and the rest are vaccinated. Every single one of them last time had COVID and they were on placements where me and my other colleague who are not vaccinated, we didn't get COVID. So for me, um, when, when I was looking at that and thinking, well, they've all got COVID, they all could pass it on. Um, I don't I don't really see the difference between me and them. Um, or I'm guessing because your students all young, all healthy, even if they did get COVID, uh, they managed to recover it uh, from it quite quickly, please God. Uh, but what about if you come into, um, into contact with somebody who's older or somebody who's frail or somebody who's had to shelter but then is going out on the tube for an appointment that they have to keep? What about them? So in, in, there's always risks with everything. Um, you know, I've personally had quite a lot of people that have gone into hospital and ended up dying of hospital-borne diseases. It's, it, it sounds really a little bit cutthroat, but it's, it's quite normal to go into a hospital, especially when you're old and you're frail. Um, and that's why they try to get you out of hospital as quickly as possible, because there are hospital-borne diseases there. But for myself, if I'm testing, I know I don't have COVID and I'm going in, I'm healthy, um, and I've got antibodies, then... I wouldn't be any more harmed them than someone that is vaccinated. I, I, I didn't quite understand what you were saying there. I'm being a bit stupid. It's Thursday morning, it's too early. What are you saying about elderly people going into hospital? So that they're, well, they're pretty frail anyway. So coming into well, contact with in you. Healthcare, in healthcare, you know, when you've got someone that's frail coming into hospital, you do want to get them out as soon as you can because there are hospital-borne diseases. That's why there's pneumonia and stuff in hospitals. So in general, healthcare, we've always try to make sure you know they, they, they get out so that they are safe and they, they are healthy because you know hospitals are places where people can catch things but when you are talking about for me myself am I at harm to them am I at risk to them that it's the same thing I'm at the same risk to them as an unvaccinated person or a vaccinated person because if I'm testing and I do not have it then I can't pass it on to them and it's the same with someone that's vaccinated. If they if they even have the vaccine, if they have it, if they get um, COVID, they're still going to pass it on to people. And the problem that I'm seeing is people that are vaccinated suddenly think, oh, OK, I'm vaccinated now, so that makes me safer, but it doesn't. It still means that they need to test. It still means that they need to wear PPE. It still means they can pass it on to people. So it, there, there isn't much difference. But do you accept that there's less chance of passing it on if you have been vaccinated? I've, you know, I've looked at data, I've looked at the science and everything like that. And I'm, that is a possibility to be fair. I haven't looked into it enough to know the percentage of me passing it on or someone else passing it on. But the fact is, if I don't have it, or if I had the antibodies, we're, we're, we're taking away from the fact that most people have had COVID and they have antibodies. Are we saying that the vaccination is now better than what our, our body naturally does? That's the in, in healthcare, we always try to do the, the you know, the least in, invasive treatment for people. So if someone's got antibodies, why would we then inject them with something that's more invasive? That, that is generally not what healthcare does. To protect other people that they might be sat next to on the tube who might be, uh, vel um, I don't know, frail or vulnerable? Well, if someone is, for example, frail and vulnerable, you know, they could, they could get COVID from a vaccinated person. That, that's what I'm trying to say, but, you know. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. They're less likely to, aren't they? The the likelihood, I don't I don't know the percentages of everything, but I think I think the main the main problem, the main thing that we're seeing that people um, are upset about is the fact that we care about people so much as healthcare workers that we want them to live in a world where they can choose, pick and choose what treatments they get. You know, 
every day people come into healthcare and they say, I don't want a treatment, even though it could save their lives or something, but that's their choice. And I respect that. And I, I love that person, regardless of what they, they choose to do. But we're living in a society now where we're discriminating against people and we're acting quite harshly towards people that have made a decision about their body. And that's what something that I, I don't stand for that. I don't think that's right. OK, it's good to talk to you. I'm so sorry we're out of time. Um, let's, uh, let's chat again soon. Thanks very much for taking the time to join us this morning. Thank you. That's OK. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Coming up after the break, uh, talking more about the energy crisis challenges with Labour. Stay tuned.